All right, everyone, we're good to go. Today is Friday, July 9th, and the time is 9.07. The AB 3121 Task Force meeting is now called to order. Good morning, my name is Camila Moore, and I am the chair of the task force. Before we begin, let's have the staff do a roll call for attendance so that we can establish whether we have a quorum. Good morning, uh, Chair Camila Moore. You are recognized. Um, thank you. I will now conduct the roll call by task force member, beginning with the chair, Chair Moore. Present. Vice Chair Dr. Brown. Present. Senator Stephen Bradford. Here. Dr. Cheryl Grills. Sorry, present. Lisa Holder? Here. Assemblymember Reginald Jones Sawyer? Dr. Javon Scott Lewis? Present. John Tamaki? Here. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Steph? Here. Madam Chair, there are nine task force members and the number in Edom for a quorum is five. The number present is eight. Madam Chair, a quorum has been established. Thank you, Ms. Belton. Members of the task force and members of the public, welcome to the second meeting of the task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. At this time, I would like to take a moment to remind ourselves of the historic nature of this task force. As a reminder, the task force held its inaugural meeting on the centennial of the Tulsa Race Massacre, one of the many race-based attacks on African Americans in the United States that occurred without justice. Since our last meeting, major developments surrounding repertory justice have emanated from our national and international consciousness. In particular, last month, President Biden signed a bill declaring Juneteenth a federal holiday, one day after the legislation was approved by the House following Senate approval. The oldest commemoration of the end of slavery in the United States, Juneteenth honors June 19th, 1865, when a proclamation in Galveston, Texas declared that slaves, or enslaved people rather, were finally free two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Also, the United, Human, United Nations Human Rights Chief in a landmark report launched last month is urging countries worldwide to do more to help end discrimination, violence, and systemic racism against people of African descent and to make amends to them, including through reparations. Interestingly enough, the United States Department said it had received a copy of the report that it supports the amplification of victims' voices, as well as those of their families and communities in all countries. Further, the statement read, the United States is committed to treating every person with dignity, upholding human rights, championing opportunity, defending freedom, and strengthening the rule of law, the statement said. We recognize that our country has not always lived up to these ideals, particularly for African Americans and other people of color. But in more somber news, hate crimes against black people increased to their highest number in more than a decade in the state of California. According to a report released last week by the California Department of Justice, 457 hate crimes with an anti-Black bias or anti-African-American bias were reported to law enforcement in 2020. That represents a nearly 88% increase from 2019. In all, we have much work to do, and I can confidently say that this task force is well poised to do this work. From a review of the agenda, you can see that it's a full agenda. So to ensure that we complete during the time allocated, we will need to make sure that we follow the timeline established. 
So to help keep us on time, I'm asking that we all become mindful um, and I will remind um, us as well if we start to fall behind. So we do anticipate a fair number of comments from members of the public, which at this time is scheduled for one hour beginning at 3.30 p.m. and will end at 4.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if you recall from the last session, there were comments from the public asking us to notice the scheduled time for public comments as they need to arrange time to attend. So we did that to make sure that we follow um, that we follow that. And if we are not at that point, we will pause the agenda and go to public comment at 3.30. Again, welcome, and we will now move forward to agenda item number two, which is the introduction of and the presentation by Parliamentarian Dorothea Johnson. So again, to help us stay on task with respect to meeting procedure, I have the great pleasure to introduce the task force parliamentarian, Ms. Dorothea Johnson. She is quite experienced with Robert's Rules of Order and Parliamentary Procedure. Recently retired, she last served as the General Counsel and Deputy Director of the California State Department of Consumer Affairs, where she applied parliamentary procedure in her work with the public boards that were within that department. During the past 20 years, she has served as a parliamentarian for a number of community workshops on parliamentary procedure to organizations, including the State Bar of California. Uh, various California State Board members and individuals, uh, members of organizations as well. Today, she will provide a brief overview to the public of the parliamentary rules of procedure that will be followed during our meetings in moving the agenda forward specifically regarding handling motions. Ms. Johnson, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. A bit louder. A bit louder. Is this louder? Yes. Okay, I'll hold it. Okay, is this better? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Madam Chair, good morning and to the members of the task force. I want to first thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to provide members of the public with an overview of the rules under which this task force will function. Those rules are generally identified and accepted as a form of parliamentary procedure known as Robert's Rules of Order. The basic principle that is, uh, is that a proposal or an idea that's introduced by the members as a motion becomes an action of this task force if a majority of the task force members present in voting at a meeting votes in favor of that motion. I will take a few moments to walk the public through how a motion is made and carried through and how a member may leave and return the meeting, return to the meeting. I will also take a few minutes to guide the public on how the task force will propose ideas and discuss and make decisions regarding those ideas, including voting on them. This process, again, is known as making and carrying through a motion. Although these, although these procedures may seem rigid, and formal, it does three things. It keeps order, it helps to avoid conflict, and it makes sure that each member of the task force has a member, uh, an opportunity to speak on what is being discussed. To begin, the chair will announce the agenda items in the order that they're presented unless the members ask to change that order. The chair may ask task force members for motions on the subject that is being discussed or on the subject that is identified on the agenda. For example, by saying, is there a motion to accept the minutes, either as presented or as corrected? The motion must be seconded by one of the members before action can take place. Once a motion is seconded, the motion can be voted on, it can be withdrawn, it can be amended or tabled. And to table an action, 
a motion of a motion means that you're postponing the consideration of a pending motion until a later time that you can set specifically or just generally. Before a motion is um, voted on, the chair will ask if there is any discussion. That is to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. The chair will recognize the members in order that they have asked to be recognized by raising their hand until the discussion is ended. If there is no further discussion or when it appears that there's no further discussion, the chair will then ask, is there any further, to dis of any further discussion? If she hears nothing, she will call for a vote on the motion by saying, are you ready for the question? And repeating the motion so you know what exactly you're voting on. As this is a virtual meeting, the vote will be by roll call. The chair will explain that the staff will call the roll and the task force members will answer either yay or yes or no or nay. If the task force member is present but does not wish to vote on the motion, he or she will say, I abstain when their name is called for the vote. Following this, the chair will then say that the staff person will call the roll or by calling, by calling each member's name and repeating their vote as she records the vote in writing. Following the vote, the staff person will inform the chair of the conclusion by stating the number of yay or yes votes, the number of nay or no votes, and the number of abstentions. With that information, the chair will then announce the number of yeas, nays, and abstentions, and will then announce whether the motion has passed or failed. Now, a motion must receive a majority of the votes cast to pass. Consequently, if there is a tie, the motion fails. Likewise, if, for example, if the vote is one yay, no nays, and six abstentions, the motion is carried. It passes. After announcing the vote and stating whether the motion passes or fails, the chair will then move to the next agenda item by stating the next item for consideration is and identifies the item number and moves forward. Now that's a brief overview and that concludes my overview with respect to handling motions. To be adopted as stated, the motion must receive a majority of the votes cast. Once the chair has repeated the motion and after it has been seconded by a member, that motion will be discussed until all of the members wanting to make comments have had, have had an opportunity to do so or, or in the event that a member feels that enough time has been spent discussing that motion, they will simply, uh, or they simply want to move the matter forward to a vote without further delay, then they can make a motion to end the debate by saying, I move the previous question. This will immediately end the debate or discussion and the question to end debate is first voted on. If it passes and you need a two thirds vote to pass a motion to end the debate, if it passes, the debate is ended and the task force votes on the main motion. That is the procedure that will be generally uh, followed with respect to all of the action items. Now, finally, I'd like to clarify for the public some quirks relating to attendance during a virtual meeting. As you all know, we must have a quorum to take action during the meeting. That quorum <clears throat> is set by statute, as you've heard, is five. And the presence of a quorum is established by roll call at the beginning of the meeting. 
Members leaving a meeting can impact whether a quorum is still present. Members who leave the meeting before adjournment will always announce their departure. And when they return before the meeting is adjourned, they will announce their presence at the first opportunity without disrupting or interrupting anyone. This allows the task force to continue its business and recognize that if a quorum was lost by a member's departure, that it has been subsequently reestablished when they return. And any further action there, uh, thereafter that has been taken by the task force will be deemed a valid action with a quorum present. Note that once a vote has taken place and a roll call has been concluded, the names of those individuals who fail to answer when, the name, when their name was called for the vote can be called again by the staff person before the announcement of the results by the chairman. <clears throat> this allows them to, again, capture any votes that may have been lost because a member left, but they came back before, you know, they were out for a brief moment, and they came back before the announcement by the chair of the outcome of the meeting. Now, this concludes my very, very brief uh, presentation on parliamentary procedure. I want to thank you all for your time and your attention. And to the members of the task force, I'm available to answer your questions or to provide additional information if you want to further, further clarification on some point or on how to take a particular action with respect to a motion or some other action that you wish to take relevant to your meeting. Madam Chairman, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. Have a great meeting today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. We're looking forward to working and partnering with you throughout this process. So the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. We are on action item number three. The minutes from the June 1st task force meeting were sent to you with, mater with the materials and you have had a chance to review them. Are there any questions, comments, or corrections regarding the minutes? I move the adoption of the minutes of the previous meeting. Okay, is there a motion, is there a second to the motion? Okay. Mr. So, Tamaki seconded. Yeah. Sorry. So moving forward, we have to vocalize. Um, we have to vocalize everything. So there is a motion on the floor to move and to there. Sorry, <laughs> there has been a motion on the floor to accept the meetings as presented. It has been seconded by Don Tamaki. Is there any discussion? Call for the question. Okay. Hearing that there's no discussion and hearing that Dr. Brown called the question, is there a second to call the question, the previous question? I second. Okay. The motion, sorry, Dr. Brown gave a motion to call the previous question. Uh, Lisa Holder seconded the motion. Um, now that now I will go to Ms. Belton, uh, where she will call the well, please call the need to vote, Madam Madam Chair. Uh, would you please call for a vote on calling the question and then go back to the minutes? Yeah, call a, yeah, okay. call the question on. I mean, call a, for a vote on the question. Ask if there's if all those in favor of calling the question say aye or have the have them vote on calling the question. Okay, thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Okay, now we will take a vote on calling the question. All those in favor of calling the question, say aye. 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 Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is a virtual meeting and I'm forgetting my own rule. You must do a roll call on calling the question. So Ms. Ms. Belton, if you would please uh, call the roll and ask and call the vote. <laughs> what I said. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Belton. 
Thank you, Chair Moore. Chair Moore, your vote. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown votes aye. Senator Bradford? Aye. Senator Bradford votes aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills? Aye. Dr. Grills votes aye. Lisa Holder? Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Uh, Assembly Member Joan Sawyer? Dr. Javon Scott Lewis? Aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki? Aye. Don Tamaki votes aye. Council Member Monzica Montgomery Steps? Aye. Council Member votes aye. Um, Madam Chair, on the vote to call the question, there were eight votes cast. All aye votes. So now we'll return and do another vote. <laughs> um, so basically it's been moved and seconded to adopt the minutes as presented. Um, now I will return to Ms. Belton to call a roll call vote on that motion. Thank you, Chair Moore. Chair Moore, your vote, please. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown votes aye. Senator Bradford? Abstain. Senator Bradford abstains. Dr. Cheryl Grills? Aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills votes aye. Lisa Holder? Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Uh, Assembly Member Joan Sawyer? Dr. Javon Scott Lewis? Aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki? Aye. Don Tamaki votes aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Steps? Aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Steps votes aye. Madam Chair, on the motion, there are seven yay votes and one abstention. Thank you, Ms. Belton. The vote was seven ayes and one abstention. The ayes have it and the motion carries. The minutes are approved as presented. Now we will move to agenda item number four, where we will have an open discussion of community engagement. So this item entails um, the staff so basically, yeah, this item entails an open discussion of community engagement. The staff received feedback and ideas for consideration from the task force members. As staff implements our plan, we need to give them a direction on how we define the community in the community engagement plan. Also, um, if task force members have presentations regarding this agenda item, get ready uh, because we will be queuing those presentations and if you would like to present, um, you know, just raise your hand and I will recognize you. Um, at this time, though, let's just begin with our open discussion. Uh, for the members of the public, what you see on the screen are ideas from different task force members regarding community engagement. Uh, but again, there are more um, delineated proposals that we'll probably be discussing uh, within this agenda item. But for now, um, Let's stay true to the agenda and just have an open discussion briefly on our ideas of what community engagement could look like. Um, and to structure that conversation, again, the question on the floor is, how should we define the community and our community engagement plan? Um, what are your thoughts? Again, if you have any thoughts, please raise your hand and I will recognize you so that we can begin a discussion. Uh, Madam Chair. Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. What are your comments or thoughts? Foremost, should not be our understanding that the people who are the subject of the offense of racism and injustice are the community. Any other persons external to those who are the victims. 
would be invited as, in my estimation, consultants. Thank you for your thoughts, doc Dr. Brown. Um, would anyone like to build off of what Dr. Brown just stated? Um, if not, um, if any members have any um, structure presentations they would like to present at this moment, we can do that. Yeah, this is uh, Lisa Holder. Point of order, can we remove the, um, the item that's currently on the screen so we can have a full picture as we have this discussion? Um, and also, I have a response and addendum to what Dr. Brown had to say about the community and what the community entails and is composed of. Um, I have take a much broader view of the community. Um, as I initially stated, I, I believe that an important mandate, an implicit mandate for us is to engage the community broadly. Uh, and to have an inclusive and multicultural process. I believe that part of our mandate is to create a process that allows for uh, restorative justice, that allows for healing communities, and that allows for repairing the narrative of America, right? And creating a much more inclusive multicultural narrative as opposed to the narrative that exists currently, which tends to be a majority narrative um, based on uh, 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 white supremacist ideals. That said, the, given that repairing the narrative function, I think it's very important to define the community broadly so that people feel involved in that healing process. So, um, people from all cultures can be a part of that he healing process, can be a, a part of that educational process, so that as a broader multicultural community, we can come out of this restorative process more enlightened and prepared for true authentic reconciliation. So my belief is that the community that we are attempting to engage is a multicultural community with special consideration for the descendants of slavery. Thank you, Ms. Holder. Um, and I also intend to agree with you, I think, it would be best to define um, community broadly so that we, as you stated, you know, have a broad-based coalition of support uh, moving forward in this process. Uh, does anyone else on the task force have any open-ended comments at this time about how we should define community again before we get to more structured presentations from task force members if, if possible? Mr. Javon Lewis, Scott Lewis, you are recognized. What are your thoughts and comments? Thank you, Madam Person. Uh, I just want us to take into consideration that AB 3121, um, you know, says that the task force um, is convened to study and develop uh, reparation proposals for African Americans with a special consideration for African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. And so I'm wondering if there's any further clarification about what this special consideration means in respect to the more generalized uh, kind of identification of African-Americans that, that comes before. So in other words, how are we, how are we thinking about the relationship between this broader indication um, again, so studying and developing reparation proposals for African Americans, comma, with a special consideration for African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Thank you, um, Javon Scott Lewis, for bringing up that very 
important point. Um, does anyone have any comments or wanted to build off of what Javon Scott Lewis just said about how do we contemplate um, the distinction even between um, African Americans and African Americans who descend from chattel slavery in the United States as it pertains specifically to community engagement? I was also going to say, Javon Scott Lewis, I think that's kind of jumping the cart before the horse. Um, that is a huge issue that we're, we're going to have to address um, in, in some way, in some manner. And so I just want to say thank you for bringing that up. Um, if, if task force members don't have any comments on that particularly, um, I think we'll just make a note of that um, in the meeting minutes and we'll just continue to move forward with our open-ended discussion on how should we define the community in terms of our community engagement plan. I do not want to belabor this open discussion any more than necessary. So if there aren't any other open-ended comments on this agenda item, I would like to move forward to a more structured discussion or presentation from task force members. Dr. Grills, you are recognized for your thoughts. Thank you. I, um, I do have a presentation of some thoughts on a community engagement process for the task force to consider if we're done with the open discussion. Yes. Any last co any comments? If not, I'd like to d recognize Dr. Grills and she can begin her presentation. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And can this be seen? I can't see anyone, so I'll need someone to verbally tell me if they can see my screen properly. Yes, Dr. Grove, we can see. Oh, okay, thank you. So what, what I, I've spent the last, since our last meeting, since our first meeting, I have spent an incredible amount of time thinking about this idea about community engagement for the task force. And that's uh, in part um, due to my, what I see as a, as a critical need to always have community voice involved in deliberations that affect the community. Um, and then secondly, um, having had the experience of being someone who provided testimony at another California task force a couple of years ago, which was the um, Childhood Poverty Task Force for California, I went to present to them about community engagement and also um, was then asked by that task force to actually design and implement a community engagement process for them across the state, which I did. Uh, and that process led to information that was not necessarily on the radar screen of that task force and it nuanced other pieces of information and ideas that were being cultivated within that task force. So um, I know that that process is important and I have experienced showing how it can work and thought I would share a couple of ideas based on um, probably about 20 meetings I've had now with different entities um, within the state of California and beyond the state. So. Um, let me get right to the point and the idea here. And that, what I'm thinking about is not just a community engagement process, but a robust process. So one of the things that's important is that we as a task force not see ourselves operating in a vacuum and not to take or assume that the public comment that happens at the end of our meetings it, you know, is adequate to represent community voice. So to avoid operating in a vacuum, I suggest that we have a number of public listening sessions, right? That And these listening sessions would occur above and beyond the formal task force meeting. So they will not um, impact the number, that, that magic number of 10 that we seem to be operating with, but they go far and beyond that, but they don't violate um, bagley Peen and they don't, um, infringe upon the number of formal meetings. So in that regard, I'm going to share with you a community engagement strategy for your consideration. 
First and foremost, this requires a coordinated facilitated process. And I did have a conversation with a couple of conversations with the uh, Ralph Bunch Center at UCLA um, as a possible hub to hold and coordinate and facilitate a community engagement process. They themselves would not do the process, but would bring the key players to the table to design and implement that process. So within that context, we would be able to provide a process that brings additional researchers to the table to inform, um, to support, and to align with the community engagement process that would necessarily include a communications process and messaging and marketing to the community. So what would happen is that you would have a series of organizations or organizing entities across the state who are tapped into networks based on a number of factors and that these organizations um, would have the benefit of subject matter experts to work with them. They would be coordinated and, co and collaborating and doing strategic outreach in connection to each other because they're being coordinated and facilitated. Um, and they would then be able to do messaging in advance of the listening session so that people come to the table with a kind of basic um, baseline foundation of understanding about what is reparations, what is this task force about, what are the, the issues that need to be understood to have an informed conversation, um, and then how do we ensure that diverse perspectives, voices, and stakeholders are brought to the table. So I'm suggesting that this body that could be convened by uh, and held by the Bunch Center would organize themselves around a series of buckets, if you will, topics, constituencies that need to be addressed. One example would be regions of the state, for, for example. There, we can't just rely on Northern California and Southern California. We can't just look at urban areas. We need to look at rural areas. We need to understand what's happening, for example, in areas like the Central Valley and what's happened to and continues to happen to black farmers. And so around the, the bucket of regions, there may be several listening sessions that are held that involve a dual process of information flow. There would be information specifically around reparations education going out from this body uh, and these organizers to the constituencies who would be engaged around regions. And then the input from the listening sessions would go back to the organizing body, but also to the coordination and facilitation process that could be happening through the Bunch Center, and ultimately that information would come to the reparations task force. Another bucket, if you will, could be systems involved folks, and here we're talking about a number of things from um, the criminal justice system that we could have organizers who engage, for example, people like uh, A New Way of Life, um, or all of us or none, there are a number of groups that are dealing with issues of incarceration and reentry. And so we could bring to bear their voice on reparations ideas, but also systems in other areas like uh, the child welfare system. And again, a number of listening sessions would then be um, you know, implemented around systems involved folks. There's the social safety net, which could be another bucket. And within that context, you're talking about outreach to um, those who are re responsible for and have, who have been holding the community um, needs and trying to respond to those, whether that be associations like the black social workers, the black psychologists, the black nurses, the black physicians, social service agencies, uh, child welfare advocates, et cetera. And so again, a number of listening sessions would be orchestrated with that combined collaborative understanding across the different organizing entities from A to, to F. Then there would also be kind of in alignment with the conversation about what constitutes community, um, 
listening sessions that involve affinity groups or allied groups. In other words, we live in an ecosystem. Black folk exist in an ecosystem, and that ecosystem includes a very diverse cultural base of, of people, social class, education levels, et cetera. So how do we make sure that those who are part of the ecosystem within which we will be understanding reparations and coming up with reparations recommendations that could impact them, they need to be at the table. So um, that could be um, in any event, let me stop there. So fifth bucket would be something broad like economics. And that would be an opportunity to engage uh, a number of groups or entities, including like, for example, organizations like the Black Workers Center, et cetera, who could bring out their base, who could bring out their constituents to talk about the impact of economics, to talk about wealth promotion, not just for individuals, but across generations, et cetera. Sixth bucket could be philanthropy and philanthropy, um, has a role to play. Um, there are some examples among Native Americans right now where they have come up with a strategy that California um, uh, philanthropic organizations are considering that has a multi-generational um, approach. So for example, these, these philanthropic organizations will be paying a land tax every year to Native American entities in the state. So how do we also include philanthropy? Now, and I mentioned earlier that I've been having a series of conversations with individuals and organizations since our first meeting. I included philanthropy uh, in those, those conversations I was having, and I have been able to get a soft commitment if we come up with a, an engagement strategy um, that is um, well thought through, coordinated, um, and multifaceted then this particular philanthropic organization would actually put money on the table to support our efforts. So for example, the DOJ um, staff could help support the cost of uh, resourcing these different organizations to get their base and their constituents out to help with the information sharing and communication strategy. The philanthropic organization would pay for the researchers to support these organizations, to support the messaging, um, uh, et cetera. And then the last bucket, uh, because communication and messaging is so critical, um, we might engage an entity like the National Association of Black Journalists to bring to bear how to keep this issue and our work at the forefront of the minds of the black community first and foremost, but secondly, to California um, uh, writ large. So these, this, this process, I think, could be a way to have an organized, robust engagement of diverse voices across California to both inform them about what we're doing and about basic issues around reparations, and then to inform us from different perspectives about what reparations should look like and what it should and could include based on their lived experience, their personal harm, the historical harm, and the ongoing, I can't tell you how many things I have heard across the state that are examples of current harm that is the legacy of the historical harm. And by the way, one last thing I wanted to mention is that within this process, there are cities and areas of California that are establishing their own reparations task forces. Um, and some of them have already gotten started. We want to be able to have the benefit of engaging them as well. And I would factor them in under this category of regions. So that is um, what I'm offering as, a, as an initial idea about um, community engagement, and I would, in, when the time is right, um, like to remind us that in Article 4, the section on powers, 431, AB 3121, Section 8301.3, Section B, says that any subcommittee 
or member of the task force may, if authorized by the task force, to take any action that the task force is authorized to take pursuant to this section. In other words, I'm offering to the task force um, to continue fleshing this out, putting concrete names and organizations and entities um, to those buckets and to those organizations A through F. Um, Ralph Bunch Center is poised and ready to support. The foundation is ready and poised to support. Um, but it, because of Bagley Keen, we can't really form subcommittees. Um, so we need someone to kind of work with the DOJ staff. So perhaps at the appropriate time, someone might put a motion before the, the task force to task me to work with DOJ to finish this out, to then bring back this idea or concept with all of the details in place for a formal vote by the task force as our approach to community engagement. Thank you. Sorry I took so long. No uh, apologies uh, necessary. Um, yes, go ahead, Dr. Brown. I need some help. What would you need assistance with? What would you like assistance with? In terms of clarity of understanding as to what this task force was to be about, that was appointed by the administrative and legislative arms of the state. and that we were not to be involved in administrative activity. The policy making, review, and coming up with what we think generically. Black folks, nobody but black folks have been wronged on in this nation and what would be a reasonable, common sense, factual response. And the minutia was to be dealt with by the mechanism that would be established. We, we can't be everywhere. We have our lives, we're human. And we have just two years to do, this, to do this work. And again, I say, maybe that's the benefit that I have at 80 years old. I've been around this bush, going back to the kernel reports, the unfinished agendas. It was the same thing. And we make it a paralysis of an analysis. Why? Because we don't have the will, the will and the political clout to eventuate change. And basically the vote too. So I hope that we would, we would reflect on that and look at what is realistically doable, achievable, that we will not get bogged down and being like that ship that Mark Twain mentioned on the Mississippi River, it took so much steam to blow the whistle. They didn't have enough power to paddle up the riverbed. Thank you for that. Um, first I wanted to also thank Dr. Grills for a very robust uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Grills, did you have any comments maybe to what uh, Vice Chair Brown stated? Um, it, yeah. No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if not, I wanted to, I'll go ahead. Uh, uh, Senator Bradford, you are recognized. What are your thoughts or comments? I, I want to thank Dr. Grills for a very comprehensive uh, presentation on what inclusion looks like. And I think 
Uh, it's a great format. I think uh, Dr. Brown has some great concerns and uh, points to be made. Um, so I hope we try to comprehend that. But I think uh, what has been laid out by Dr. Grills is really a comprehensive approach of what is going to be needed in order to touch all factions. And I'm glad she touched upon something that I've been already in discussion with. And the black farmers, I mean, their voices need to be heard in, in discussion because there were thousands of African American farmers, uh, less than, you know, uh, I, I forgot years, but now is, we're down to a, a few dozen. Uh, here in the state of California, and we should be concerned about that because they too uh, were integral in, uh, you know, what we who we were as uh, people. But I also would add, as you you mentioned, the, the Ralph Bunch Institute, and we worked with them closely in the legislature. But one that I'd also add to this discussion is the Merv Dimley uh, Institute uh, for Political and Economic Empowerment that is established at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And they're doing a lot of this work also. So I would just add them to part of the uh, team of helping do the research, the outreach, and, and kind of like um, compiling all this information and help uh, shape thought and discussion as well going forward. Thank you, Senator Bradford. Uh, Dr. Grills, would you like to make a motion regarding your community gauge engagement plan at this time? So, I have a question, Madam Chair, a point. Yes, Vice so what, what do we what do we do if Susan Jones or James Jackson's group comes up with plan? What do we do if around this state without our having given due diligence to announce to everybody that you can present your plan to? whether it's in Northern California, Central area, wherever. We talk about transparency, we talk about a conclusion. But we, if we're about that, we should be about it. Absolutely. Dr. Brown, I do. I, I plan on presenting uh, for, the, for the fifth agenda item on the public hearing proposals and um, your comments or your feedback about transparency and reaching out to folks um, from the state level, even national level, that's something that I have addressed in my presentation. Um, but I, I, in, a, in a way that's separate and apart um, um, from this community engagement plan. But I do want to assure you that I hear you, I'm listening to you, and I've already thought about those types of concerns um, in the presentation that I prepared. Um, does that suffice for you for now, Vice Chair? Um, at this no, moment, no, yeah. That, that, that does not suffice what I'm saying. If you have one group that has a background track record of doing this kind of work that has been represented here, there are other groups who would say, we should have been given due notice that the same was an offering. That's all I'm saying. And that's being consistent, that's being ethical, and that's being fair. Chairman. Um, Sorry, it's my fault. Yes, this is Parliamentarian Johnson. Um, I can address this concern if you'd like me to. Go ahead, Parliamentarian Johnson. When you have a motion on the floor, or if a motion is made, that is a as uh, Senator Bradford mentioned, and as initially defined by Member uh, Grill, you can build on that motion. You can accept the motion because, as I understand it, she she indicated that it was a starting point, and you can always amend it. You can take away from it, but you'll have something to build on, and you can simply put in the form of the motion that it is an initial plan, and that way you don't have to be concerned about not having an opportunity to address additional plans that may be provided to you but you can also add a time by which those plans need to be provided to you so that you have, because one of the things uh, Dr. Brown mentioned was the time, you know, the limited time that you have. So you can set a time on that, uh, those additional plans that you may get from community organizations. But I believe um, Ms. Uh, Member Grills mentioned 
a method of going out to the community. So I think if you have the plan and you have a motion, because you can't really do anything unless you have a motion, that way you have something to act on. If you do that, then you can build on it, detract, you know, take away, add to it. Uh, Senator Bradford, member Bradford mentioned uh, some things as well, you know, comments that were very good from both all of the members who've spoken. So, but you want a starting point and to get something in writing that each member can look at and you can have something that when you start getting things from other community organizations, you can have a comparative base and you can use that as you build to make sure you include, Dr. Brown, those, that, that information that is being provided or the plan that is being provided, that's all. So you want to start with your motion, and, and if that's what you want to do, it's been seconded. So uh, your part of your discussion is that. But, but Madam, Madam Chair, again, and then I leave this alone. It was no prior announcement by this task force that was circulated around the state that we would be considering a community engagement plan coming from all sectors. We know that. Item number four. I'm talking about prior announcement with the date for people to have their plan into this task force. That's why I said, Dr. Brown, I just stated that you can ask, they're not closing. I didn't hear anyone say that, that there's no opportunity to submit anything else. Madam Chair. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Thank you, Vice Chair. Again, Vice Chair, I hear your comments um, and I want to thank you uh, for those comments. Um, moving forward, we, we will have public comment in the beginning of our public hearings. Um, but nevertheless, I wanna get back to Dr. Grills. Again, thank you, Dr. Grills, for your robust um, presentation. Uh, Dr. Grills, at this moment, would you like to put a motion on the floor regarding your community engagement plan. Um, I, I can, it feels kind of odd for me to put a motion on the floor for me to task myself <laughs> to do something. So yeah. if I- I, I, would, I would agree. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's not appropriate for you know her to make her own motion, but I- That's I, a comment I, that from the parliamentarian, by the way. So excuse me, go ahead, uh, Senator Bradford. I, I, I just want to build on what Dr. Brown is stating. And I think it's the fact that I too was unaware that we were asked to put together a comprehensive plan or what community outreach could look like. And I think that's the only concern he's expressing right here. Uh, I think it's a brilliant plan. I, I like I say, other than some suggestions and building upon it. So I clearly hear where the parliamentarian is stating, but I too was unaware because I probably would have put something together myself, but I was just unaware that that was being asked us at this time. And I think that's uh, kind of like speaks to his unreadiness uh, at this point, if if I'm able to speak for Dr. Brown. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would suggest that we let the task force know for a stated time for plans, plans, plural, to be in for this task force to consider for a community engagement plan. And I'm knocking the quality, <clears throat> the uh, significance of the plan committed by Dr. Drill. I think if we do that, all bases are covered. And everybody be happy. Yes, in terms of compromise, um, again, you know, we can look to, you know, Lisa, Ho sorry, uh, Dr. Grill's plan and seek to build upon it and get more uh, input from other uh, from other groups along the way. Um, that's just kind of what I'm conceptualizing. But Dr. I mean, Vice Chair, are you, you did, did you want to put a, a motion at this time, or were you just Vocalizing your concerns. Did you want to uh, vocalize your concerns in a motion? I make, I make a motion that the task force would announce publicly that we are receiving proposals for a robust plan for community engagement 
and by the time our next meeting, we will, we will vote on this matter. That's my motion. There has been a motion on the floor, floor from Dr. Uh, from Vice Chair uh, Brown that the task force will announce publicly um, the uh, um, proposals for community engagement, and then at our next meeting we will consider um, those proposals. Is there a second to this motion? I'll just repeat, is there a second to this motion? If not, the motion fails. Is there an, another another motion on the floor at this at this time in re, no. in, in relation to our community to the open discussion of community engagement? Excuse me. I don't have a motion, but you know, I my understanding is that we were going to discuss, you know, have have a discussion. And so I think Dr. Grill's presentation um, is is a you know appropriate starting point, as as Dr. Grill has noted. So perhaps we could actually discuss the presentation, which we didn't have any time to do. Um, Senator Bradford noted a few other parties, uh, other resources that he would like to have included. Perhaps the remaining task force uh, members would like to also add their recommendations as part of a discussion, which we can use Dr. Grill's presentation as a, you know, as a, a kind of structured uh, point of discussion. Okay, Dr. Grills, would you like to facilitate this conversation? Um, I just wanted to say one point, Chair Moore, if that's okay. Yes, Tamaki, you are recognized. I really agree with uh, Professor Scott Lewis's point and, and Dr. Grills. Um, I understand that uh, Lisa Holder also has a schematic and, and a lot of the elements of her, uh, these ideas really cross each other and, and help collab, uh, corroborate each other. And I agree with you, uh, Professor Scott Lewis, that this is uh, a great discussion. And I, I think um, it doesn't have to be the only plan. In other words, uh, as we go forward, there may be other conveners uh, in other regions of the state and, and uh, equally resourced and qualified. And <clears throat> a number of these things could go on multiple different tracks. So I'm really in favor of getting started with something that we can can build on. Uh, what I worry about is is the time element because time is of the essence, and uh, the public needs to see the task force move along. At the same time, however, uh, we can't be seen as closing the door on any other groups. So what Dr. Brown is saying is really well taken. So I think uh, it should be an open-ended process, but I think we sh we do need a starting point. That's all I have to say on that. Councilwoman Montgomery Step, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just had a couple of thoughts as well in, in the open discussion um, with regard to timing, and I think that as we move forward with community engagement, which is extremely important, um, not only for what we're doing for the next two years, but once we pass this thing over to the legislature, um, that, that community engagement will play a huge role there, um, along with the education that we will be um, engaging in this process. Um, I think that we, whatever we do, it needs to kind of be in sync with the task force goals, mandates, our meetings, um, and it needs to, um, Either we supplement the community engagement or the, or the community engagement supplements our work. And that way, I think that's the best way to meet the timing issues is that we, we have true coordination. We have a very um, a specific me messaging that we can build off of. Um, I completely agree that this has to be an effort that is multicultural. I also agree that we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And oftentimes, um, our goals get lost um, when we, uh, in our efforts to, to coalition build. And so I think the messaging is super important there, but whatever we do and decide, uh, we do have to be focused because we have 
uh, we're in that two year timeline to present something to the legislature. And we also, community is gonna play a big role in getting whatever we present across the finish line. And I'm just thinking in terms of, of that. So um, we also, the last thing I'll say is we have to make sure that we are making decisions in time based on the community input that we get so that we're not stuck um, but that we, you know, there will still be some hard decisions to make that we're able to make those and move forward. And I think that that may go also to what Dr. Brown is talking about, political will and, you know, knowing that, you know, this is part of the process, but there still is, um, we still have to, you know, um, present something to the legislature. So I just want to add that additional feedback that while we're continuing on, we are um, in the community engagement is in sync with the task force duties so that we can get the most feedback from the community as possible in the timeline that has been set before us. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Senator Bradford, you're recognized. I would just like to make a motion that we accept the blueprint that Dr. Grills has laid out, understanding that it's a living, breathing document that we can continue to build upon and add components moving forward. But I think in the interest of time, we do need to show uh, a, a clear pathway of what this engagement looks like. And I think she provided a very comprehensive, uh, you know, foundation or direction of where we want to go. And as we add those components, everybody's uh, able to bring in those organizations, individuals or entities that will help build upon it. But I think what she has provided is, is clear direction on what community engagement looks like regards of where it's coming from. So um, that would be my motion with the understanding that uh, we're still building upon it and it's open for continued discussion, but moving forward. Okay, so there is a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I will, I will second. Okay, so it has been moved by Senator Bradford that the task force accepts Dr. Grill's community engagement plan with the conception or idea that this is a living and working document that can be amended, um, that can and will be amended. It has been seconded by uh, Councilwoman Montgomery Stepp. Now we will have discussion. Is there any discussion on this motion? Yeah. I have, I have a point of order. This is Lisa Holder. Um, I also pre presented a community engagement plan, um, and uh, I would like to have an opportunity to discuss that plan before we adopt Dr. Brill's plan. I think that our, our plans are very much aligned, but in order for us to have a, an informed, robust discussion here, I think anyone who has a plan should be able to first present it before we adopt any one plan. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. Let me say this. Heaven and hell knows, I know of nobody that I'm interested in with a plan. However, I do know that there are persons out there who've been circulating plans. And I think we have the moral obligation as a group to let this public know that we claim to be on the side of righting the wrongs that have been perpetrated against us as a people. And I just do not feel that we should be engaged in any process without there being transparency, without there being due diligence to let other people know. And then everybody will say, we have fairness. And we're providing equality of opportunity for everybody. That's my only passionate concern. And that can be done with all the technology we have, when we let the people know. 
and based on the merits and the quality of your work, you will be considered and it will be a fair process. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Gross. Yeah, I just wanted to um, share a point of clarification. I truly appreciate um, Senator Bradford's framing of this as what I presented as a blueprint. And I think that is a, a more useful way to think about this as opposed to a process that is cast in concrete with a cast of characters already decided upon. And, and, and I'm saying that to Dr. Brown's point that I appreciate the importance of inclusivity. So in that schematic that I shared where it showed organization A, B, C, et cetera, I don't have specific names or entities plugged in for that. I've talked to folks that I know their organizing outfits and their extensive networks are interested, but that would, that's the work that still needs to be done. And we are informing the public in this very moment. That is one of our agenda items that we want to, that we are committing as a task force to a community engagement process. This is a blueprint to have it so that it is an organized, robust process. And then now the work behind the scenes needs to happen. And, and when I say behind the scenes, I mean all the logistics, getting you know people to the table, and then all of those meetings in each of those buckets. There is more than ample opportunity for anybody and everybody who wants to organize a listening session to be able to do this. So the blueprint, thank you, Senator Bradford, was intended to be a process that allowed multiple entry points into the conversation. Not only these three entities are in it and everybody else, you just have to you know, show up at a listening session. So I hope that clarifies it a little bit. And I agree with Member Holder that you know, we should hear what her um, ideas were as well. Thank you, Dr. Grills. I would like to pause for a moment. I recognize you, Tamaki, but I want to uh, note the presence of Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer. Welcome. Sorry, I'm late. I had to go see the doctor, and make sure I can attend more of these. So uh, I'm here now. Let's just get engaged. Awesome. Thank you. Um, just to reset, we're having an open discussion of community engagement. Dr. Grills gave a presentation on um, a blueprint of a community engagement plan. Uh, Senator Bradford did uh, present a motion to um, for the task force to accept the blueprint, but at this time I'm, I'm asking Dr. Bradford, would you mind, well, I would like for the motion to be withdrawn so that we're able to give Lisa Holder the time and space for her to present her motion, but, um, present her presentation before we make any motions regarding this matter. Would you like to withdraw your motion? You can table or you can withdraw whatever is the body, pleasure of the body. If you table it, you can set it for a time to be heard. Yeah, you can table it or withdraw whatever the pleasure okay. of the body. If we you will withdraw, you're going to have to start over. So that's just, those are the two things you need to concern, consider. If you okay. table it, you've got, you've got the format and you table it to a time certain and you can include, include all of those points that were made, like the additional motions, so that they can all be considered at that same time you table this motion for, and you can form it in that way. You table the motion until the next meeting when it, along with the other plans, will be considered for action. That's an, one possibility. So can we just hear her and then vote? I mean, as part of well, the, the the thing is that they uh, members Sawyer, uh, Jones Sawyer, they have more than one, so they they don't have what they're they. There's a question before you came. There was a lengthy discussion I'm about, sorry. you know, so they want to make sure that they have all of that which they want to consider. So it's not just member Holder and maybe also member uh, Lewis uh, Scott Lewis and maybe uh, you know member Montgomery Step and maybe member Br Dr. Brown. So. In order to capture everything, it sounds from what I'm hearing from your discussion that you want to have an opportunity to consider it all. And that way you will get them in writing before the meeting so that it's noticed 
and you will have at least the 10 days to look at it before your meeting. I think that's one of the things that they were all saying is that they haven't had a, a chance. Okay, thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. We'll just table the motion until after Lisa Holder presents. Go ahead, Lisa Holder. Vote on that. Okay, yeah, I just texted you and asked if we need to do a formal vote. A formal, yeah, formal I didn't. Vote. I mean, I'm talking, so I couldn't read. So, okay. Okay, so would anyone like to put a motion on the floor to table the motion that Senator Bradford put on the floor? Until... Motion to table. I made the motion to table. Okay, what's the time? Until after this discussion in this meeting or until to the next meeting, as Dorothea Johnson suggested. Senator Bradford. It was it was my intentions to do it till after Ms. Holder had opportunity to present her uh make her presentation. But if you want to carry it on to another meeting, so be it. But I was just thinking those were the two that we had today and she definitely deserves the right to be heard. I was unaware that she had a presentation or I wouldn't have put my motion forward until hearing all presentations, so. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. Um, it has yeah. been moved. Yeah. Yes. That makes it yes. Clear, yeah. <laughs> you did not get a report from some group that I don't even know who they are for community engagement. Several community groups shared through public comment and through emails to the task force members and to the formal DOJ email, their plans for community engagement, their ideas for the task force, that's all public and transparent. I'm talking about a plan that of a group that was circulated as robust regarding community engagement. Yeah. Any other task force members know anything about that? Okay, we have to move forward in the interest of time. Uh, we we can have that discussion um, later. Uh, so there has been a motion on the floor by Senator Bradford to table his motion until after Lisa Holder has a, a chance to present. Is there a second for this motion? Second. Second, Thank you. you uh, yes, yes. So it has been properly moved by Senator Bradford and seconded by Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer that we will table this uh, his motion until after Lisa Holder has a chance to present. You have heard the motion. Um, are we ready for the discussion? Is there any discussion on this matter, or can we move to a roll call vote? Move to the vote. No. Discussion. Okay. Let's Okay, no discussion. Um, I would like to cue uh, Ms. Belton and Parliamentary Johnson for the roll call vote. Yes, um, Ms. Belton, please call the roll. Chair Moore? Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown? No. Vice Chair Dr. Brown votes no. Senator Stephen Bradford? Aye. Senator Bradford votes aye. Dr. Cheryl Grill? Aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills votes aye. Lisa Holder? Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Assemblymember Joan Sawyer? Aye. Assemblymember Joan Sawyer votes aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis? Aye. Dr. Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki? Aye. Don Tamaki votes aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Step? Aye. Madam Chair? You have eight aye votes and one nay vote on the motion. Thank you, Ms. Belton and Parliamentary uh, Johnson. The vote was eight ayes and one nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize Lisa Holder so that she can give her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, the DOJ actually has the presentation if you could pick that up. Thank you. And if, if anyone is having difficulty uh, seeing that, okay. Thank you for um, 
for bringing that up so that people can see it. So I'll just preface this by saying that this plan, for lack of a better word, is, is, is very, very much aligned um, uh, with the blueprint that we just saw. Um, I, I think that Dr. Grills um, focused a little bit more on the details of how we put together, how we implement the community, community engagement plan. Um, this, this outline that I put together is a little bit broader and more about the concept generally. So there really is no conflict between the two plans. Um, I just thought it was important to have a full picture before we went ahead and, and accepted or adopted any motion. The, uh, I, I, I will tell you, uh, right up front that the objective of this plan is to carry a motion to have um, the DOJ support us in putting together a sophisticated messaging step strategy and supporting us in hiring a communications expert um, to, to assist us with community engagement and communications. So that is the, the, the action item that, that I'm focused on here. Just quickly going back up to the top of the screen, if we could go to the, the, the first two. Yeah. So as far as a community, community engagement and communication strategy, why do we need this? Well, um, number one, as, as, as member, Montgomery mentioned, you know, this is a two-year process that we have. At the end of it, we are going to have recommendations, and we are going to want to get those recommendations implemented, right? As, as um, you know, Vice Chair Brown said, political will is very important. And part of our process here is to seed the ground to build the political will that we're going to need to get our recommendations passed, right? One of the way that we do, one of the ways that we do that is through community engagement and through having a very tight, sophisticated communication strategy. One of our objectives should be to build buy-in and broad consensus among a multicultural group within the community, right? One of our other mandates is to have transparency, right? Broad transparency so that everyone in the state of California knows what we're doing, knows what our objectives are, and can, can come to the table with their ideas and also support our recommendations at the end of this process. So, so that said, in order to build that buy-in, that consensus, and to engage that transparency, I think it's going to be important to have a very strong media presence and, 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 and process for engaging with the media, and that's the print media, the broadcast media, local, national, and even international media. As to what we're doing, why we are so passionate about the need for reparations in the state of California, and um, to communicate that broadly, and to bring people into this process, right? We also need a social media and, and education and popularization strategy. One of the things that should be important to us is that we have a multi-generational focus, that we're bringing young people, youth into this process, and youth rely on social media to get their information and frankly, to get their education at this point. So if we could go back up to that section about social media and education and popularization, which is why we need a social media plan that plan could include a website that talks about what we are talking about, what our objectives are, what our recommendations are, et cetera. A website that, that, that people, that's, that's completely transparent, that people can see and engage and know what's going on. That could include public service announcements that are posted on post social media. Um, it could, it could, it, it, it could involve public service videos, YouTube videos, or, or TikTok videos so that young people know what our objectives are, 
understand what reparations is and start to become educated and informed and engaged in this process. Um, that building buy-in, as um, Dr. Grills, you know, clarified and talked about in a very robust form, involves grassroots engagement as well. If we could go up a little bit on the on the screen, yeah. So grassroots engagement. Um, so, you know, talking to organizations doing outreach to organizations all over the state of California. You know, between the nine of us, we have partnered with hundreds of community organizations. All of those, we should be informing all of those organizations that we've uh, worked with in the past and other organizations all over the state, what is going on here, what our objectives are, and doing outreach to them so that they are coming to the meetings, so that they are uh, helping us put together things like listening sessions so that they are involved in this process. I think we should also be engaging the national reparations movement and the international reparations movement because they have already seeded the ground for this process and we should be aligned with, with them as well and cross-pollinating. Um, we should also be thinking about community in events and panels in real time after the pandemic is over. What kind of events should we be partnering with and, and, and talking to the community about what we are doing? What kind of academic panels should we be engaging with and talking to them about this reparations process? Right. So this, if we could pan out so we can see it, so that we can see the um, presentation. All right. So that's the buy-in and consensus part, you know, just this multi, this multi-layered plan of engaging with uh, different aspects of the community. The other thing that I feel is critical that we are doing is as we are coming up with our recommendations, as we are evaluating the historical information that's coming to us, we should also be thinking about this process as a restorative process a healing process um, and a truth and reconciliation process. So the information that we are receiving from experts, from witnesses, from the community anecdotes and listening sessions, all of that should be heard broadly by the broader community, right? And that is part of the healing, education, and truth and reconciliation process um, that we should be engaging as well. Um, so again, like uh, Dr. Dr. Grills highlighted, I think uh, listening sessions where we hear anecdotal evidence and anecdotal testimony all across the state is going to be critical. Um, public comment that we already have a format for that that should be even more robust, um, and we should and, and we're going to be having experts and witness testimony, you know, and and and. Part of our community engagement process should be amplifying all this information that we are receiving that, and that is serving as the basis for our recommendations. It should be amplified throughout the community, right? And one of the ways that we amplify it is by making sure that we are doing media presentations, that we are doing events, that we are doing regular outreach and, um, uh, that we have a social media platform. Um, I think someone said something, but I'm, I'm just going to move on very quickly. Let's pan out again on the presentation. Let's pan out so I can see the whole screen. Okay, this is good. All right. The other, in term, that's that's really the why. The, the, the first two things that I discussed is the why. Why do we need community engagement? Why do we need a communi communication strategy? Now I want to talk a little bit more about how. And that's the, the second two. I have framing communications. As part of this communications and community engagement strategy, we need to have a very tight framing of our messaging, right? So that we don't lose our way in the coalition building process. So 
we need to have uniform messaging. We need to have messengers and surrogates. And I think that's something that Dr. Grills um, elaborated on using community organ, organ, organizers as our messengers and surrogates in this press in this process. And we need to be thinking about target audiences and nuanced messaging as well. Um, so we should be thinking very carefully about our talking points, about who are the who who are the community members who we want to have a very very tight set of talking points for. Um, who are the community members we can talk a little bit more broadly about reparations to? Um, and who do we want to serve as our surrogates to help to amplify our message? All right. And then, and then there's the logistics and the implementation part. As Dr. As as uh, Vice Chair Brown said, you know, we are just individuals. We have jobs. We have lives. We have families. We can't take on this massive administrative project by ourselves, right? We need an administrator to help us with this uh, engagement, this community engagement process and this communications process. An administrator who's gonna be doing bookings with the media, bookings for events, um, a, 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 an administrator who's gonna be tracking the communications that we have already done so that we're keeping track of how our message is getting out who we're missing, who ha we haven't gotten to, et cetera. There has to be tracking of our messaging so that we can do it in a systematic way. Um, and, you know, so so all of these administration administrative things are going to have to be uh, taken care of as well. This is a multi-layered process. This is a complex process. I've been involved in uh, doing communications for big uh, political campaigns and what it requires ultimately, if we could go down on the presentation screen, what it requires ultimately is a communications expert and perhaps even an events planning expert to help us do robust engagement. And whether or not we, 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 do, we adopt Dr. Grill's uh, 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 blueprint or tweak that a little bit, we are going to need someone, a hub, so to speak, and someone with expertise in communications to support us in this process so that we can make it happen. Um, so what I want to put on the table, the action item that I feel passionate about, is that the DOJ should be supporting us in finding a communications and events expert to help us engage the community and have a robust, a robust communication strategy implemented across the state of California. Thank you. And if people have questions, I went through that as quickly as I could, so I probably left things out, so things may be unclear. If people have questions, need some clarity, please feel free to ask. Thank you, uh, Member Holder, for a robust presentation. Um, again, uh, Member Holder has asked if anyone has any thoughts or comments or questions related to her presentation. Um, if you all do, uh, please present those at this time. Mr. Tamaki, you are recognized. Well, first, I want to thank both uh, Dr. Grills and Lisa Holder for her putting all this thought into this process. Um, the way I look at it from, for purposes of uh, what Dr. Scott Lewis was talking about in terms of discussion, that its process is a non-exclusive approach. And <clears throat> the way I, I see it is that Lisa Holder's elaboration on really critical themes on communications and um, the truth and reconciliation part is is literally just kind of aug augmenting uh, what Dr. Grills has set forth, and so uh, I, I think I think it's a great overlay. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of synergy between between those two. Um, I do want to say that um, again, there's absolutely no equivalence between what uh, Black Americans have gone through in America versus uh, Japanese Americans and the things that, that our community went through. But with respect to 
the redress and reparations effort, what Dr. Grills and Lisa Holder have has mapped out is really what was uh, followed in our effort for redress and reparations. And it boils down to how you build a movement. You know, the political will that Dr. Uh, Brown was talking about, how do you gather that speed, move the needle of public opinion, change hearts and minds uh, in a broad way? And you, it, it, what's necessary is the human stories, the acknowledgement, uh, the hearings that Japanese Americans had uh, were powerful, emotionally powerful, and they got national attention uh, and regional attention. And so I, I'm sure really that that same uh, power is going to come out in some of these community engagements. And so uh, with respect to the comm strategy, I think that's an absolutely important uh, thing that uh, Lisa Holder has put her finger on. So as I look at these two proposals, I'm seeing, you know, different parts of the same thing. And uh, I just want to put that out there that uh, I think this would be a good start. But I w would also say it's not the only way. And and if if other groups uh, present other proposals that the task force should consider, I think that's all to the good. And also, it sounds like Dr. Grills' structure is broad enough that while it has a central hub or a convener, if you will, and providing resources to, to structure and facilitate and provide technical uh, support for it, and there's funding for it. Other groups in the community uh, that have long worked on reparations can plug into that. And, and again, that's a similar model uh, to the Japanese American redress and reparations effort. So I'll stop here, but thank you both for, for doing this. Thank you, Member Tamaki, for your comments. Um, they were very thoughtful and insightful. Um, at this moment, does anyone else have any comments or questions or thoughts on Member Holder's presentation? Okay, so before we uh, get to, you know, uh, putting on any action items, I just want to take a step back for a minute and return to um, our open discussion of community engagement and just to give space uh, to members if they had any general comments not necessarily on the presentations of Member Holder and Dr. Grills, but on community engagement more broadly. I wonder if the screen could be the document mm -hmm. taken down. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, Okay, because I think it's important that, you know, we take a step back. I know, you know, we're, we're, we have to be very action oriented, but I definitely wanted to just hold some space if anyone had any general comments or feedback um, about a community engagement more broadly, um, irrespective of the two presentations today. If not, then I think we need to turn to action. Also, a quick time check. It's 1044. We do have an hour left for this agenda item. Just putting that out there we may not need that full hour. So again, at this time, um, I would like to ask the rest of the task force, is there anyone who would like to entertain a motion at this time? I would like to reintroduce my motion uh, supporting Dr. Grill's um, framework with the incorporation of the community and communications component that uh, Ms. Holder has put together. It's a comprehensive, uh, part that needs to be a part of this, but I think they both complement each other. So I think there's a blending of the two that can be uh, achieved here. So I, I think, uh, again, Dr. Grill's uh, foundation and blueprint is one to build upon and the communications part is key to making all of this work. So if that makes sense, uh, that would be my motion. And I, I'll second the motion because one is kind of like an overview, and then you get into more detail. They complement each other perfectly. Um, and in some ways, one can't be done without the other. Uh, together, I think you have the most comprehensive um, plan that you can get. So I second the motion. So it's been moved by Senator Bradford to implement uh, Dr. Grills and Member Holder's uh, presentations as blueprints to guide our community engagement process. 
um, and it has been seconded by Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer. Um, now, is there any discussion on this matter? Any further discussion on this matter, rather? If not, I would like to go to Madam Ms. Madam Chair. Yes, Vice Chair, you are recognized. I have a question. <clears throat> Has any member of the task force received any communication from a group called Politics in Black? Assembly Member Joe Sawyer has not. I have not either. Very well. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, so, if, is there any further discussion on the motion? If not, I would like to bring in Ms. Uh, Belton and Parliamentary Johnson to cue the roll call vote. Oh, yes, uh, Member Scott Lewis. Excuse me. You are yeah, so I just want to, in return to my earlier, thank you. I'm sorry. So in return to my earlier statement, pardon? Hello? You're breaking up. May I, may I proceed? Go ahead, we can hear you. Am I breaking up? Okay, this is okay. Uh, Parliamentarian Johnson. I just wanted to say this is a removal from the table of the motion made by Member Bradford. Is that correct? Okay, so you can move by consensus, move it from the table because it sounded as if there's no objection, and then move to the vote. So you would ask if there's any objection to moving it from the table. If there's no objection, then you can move right to the vote. Are you saying there, that you ask? Is there any objection to removing this from the table? No. No, no, no objection. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Now just moving, okay, so uh, then you can move it to the vote. And with that, I would say, uh, Ms. Belton, would you please call the roll with respect to the motion before the body? Oh. <clears throat> I think Dr. Scott Lewis had a had a comment first before we vote. Yes, I did. Go I ahead, Dr. Scott Lewis. Thank you very much. I, I just would like to say that I, I think it is I think it is uh, wonderful to combine these two for presentations as we've as we you know have suggested that we you know might do. Um, I would just like to you know recommend that as we move forward thinking about these presentations and the implementation into a plan for community engagement, that we do some thinking um, as these plans are implemented into how we're defining community. Returning to my earlier statement, um, both plans have used the terms broadly, and it's fine that we are thinking about a broad definition of community, but we do need to operationalize at the very least what we mean when we're saying community. Um, you know, this is my earlier statement when I said that the, the bill asked us to, you know, present a, a kind of plan for reparations for African Americans with special consideration uh, for those who are descended uh, from enslaved um, uh, African Americans. Um, I think when we're thinking about the various constituencies, we have to be mindful. So I understand this, there's a need to, to have communication, but we should appreciate that that communication will not be a blanket form of communication. There are various parties who we are trying to both represent and for those who are trying to also kind of communicate, you know, perhaps even convince of the need of this, of, of you know, of this platform. So I just want us to kind of think about the, the specific notions of community. Um, as an academic, if I can just bring that into, into this consideration, notions like community end up being really unstable, really complicated things when you, once you are trying to communicate them as a form of an action-oriented plan. Who do we mean when we're saying community, right? Who are we trying to, you know, give address and also who are we trying to give redress? These are two things that we're, 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 we're doing here, um, but I don't think that either presentation has adequately um, clarified the intended parties of, the, of their presentations. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Madam Chair, 
Madam Chair. Yes, Vice Chair, you're recognized. Uh, but keep in mind, we're in the middle of um, obtaining a roll call vote for a motion that's been on the floor. I, I know that, but I, I, please bear with me. Brother Lewis yes. touched on something that we ought to be very careful about defining a right, what we mean by community and inclusion. That's the reason why I said in my earlier comment, comments when it comes to this matter of reparations for us nobody but us black folk who went through 400 years of enslavement and 250 years of these united states of america legally in a systematized way treating us like we were tools we have to be careful that we not open this thing up to let forces come in that would sabotage us. That's my concern. Remember, Aristotle said in his politics that we were inferior because our skin was black. That we would never be capable of self-governance. We would always have to have somebody else who's white over us. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yes, Do Dr. Grills? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I do agree um, with Professor Scott Lewis that defining community is important and with Dr. Brown, that we have to think about what was the what's the driver behind this entire process, which were enslaved Africans and their descendants. So, with that being said, I think when we talk about defining community, the way I'm thinking about it and the way I was conceptualizing it in that blueprint is in terms of a series of concentric circles. Right? There are multiple communities that we are dealing with and that we have to keep our eye on. At the heart of it, at the center circle, is the African, Amen African American descendants of slaves. That's the special attention group. That's who gets privileged and prioritized. But immediately around that group, the next circle of community are people of African ancestry um, who may have been born here, uh, descendant of, uh, of enslaved Africans, but may have migrated here or emigrated here, right? Um, and who are at the receiving end of the same kinds of racial um, uh, assaults. We can't ask Amadou Diallo, you know, what his thoughts are about community because even though he wasn't born here, he wasn't a descendant of an enslaved African here, he was treated just like the brother on the street and shot down by the police. So they're being impacted in some very, very real ways, and they are part of our community. And the next layer of a circle beyond that is the California community that has multiple constituents and stakeholders. And at the end of the day, this is a California task force that has implications for all of California. And then lastly, the larger, the, not the second to the last layer, uh, concentric circle is the national landscape and all eyes are watching and we are potentially setting a precedent and providing a roadmap for the federal level, for the national level and for other states. And then ultimately around this is the last circle, which is the international community, right? Of folks of African ancestry and beyond. And so when I think about community, it is not a singular entity. There are multiple entities, but I'm laser focused the heart of the circle are African Americans, descendant of descendants of enslaved Africans, but that's not that's permeable in terms of, you know, we are we're in again we're in an ecosystem. So. Member Scott, Lewis. yes, absolutely, you're recognized. Dr. Gross, for for that for that you know clarification, I just want you know. 
exactly that, right? So that when we're using the term throughout the development of, of this plan, that we don't have this migration, right? And then this opening of the term where we are in fact losing focus. Um, you know, the, the, the point to be key for any kind of successful uh, creation of a plan. And so when we're thinking about community, I just don't want it to end up becoming too loose, or at least not even not even open or, or too 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 refined. But rather, I want us to have some precision about what we're talking about or who we're talking about when we're talking about them. Um, and so, you know, as as we you know, however this gets done, we could communicate this with DOJ partners who will help us with with implementing or creating this this plan from both your and. And Lisa Holder's presentations. I just want that to be a point that is that is kept in 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 the you know the kind of like front of our minds that we have to be very precise about who we're talking about when we're talking about community. Thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you for that um, exchange, of both members Dr. Grill and Dr. Uh, Scott Lewis. Is there any more discussion on this matter? If not, hearing no further discussion, we will continue the vote. I will cue Ms. Belton and Parliamentary Johnson at this time. And Thank to you. reiterate, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Moore. We will do the vote on the motion on the table. Chair Moore, your vote, please. On mute. Chair Moore. I'm sorry, aye. I didn't hear you. Thank you. Chair aye. Moore votes aye. Uh, Vice Chair Dr. Brown. Senator Stephen Bradford. Aye. Senator Bradford votes aye. Dr. Cheryl Grill. Aye. Dr. Grill votes aye. Lisa Holder. Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Assemblymember Joan Sawyer? Aye. Assemblymember Joan Sawyer votes aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis? Aye. Dr. Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki? Aye. Don Tamaki votes aye. Councilmember Montgom Monica Montgomery Stepp? Aye. Councilmember Montgomery Stepp votes aye. We will return again to Vice Chair Dr. Brown. Uh, Madam Chair, on this motion, you have eight members voting aye and one member who is not present for the vote. Thank you, Ms. Belton. The vote was eight ayes and one not present. The ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you. Now we will move on to agenda item number five, a discussion and adoption of procedural options for weighing evidence. We're starting this agenda item a bit early, which is actually a great thing. Um, and so under each item, um, there are seven items that has to be voted on individually. Under each item, there are several options that can be bundled together or chosen individually and voted on individually. We will address each of the seven items in order. To move orderly, I propose that we introduce each item as a motion and move to discussion after getting a second as to the item. Can we agree to that by consensus? Okay. Thank you, hearing no objections. Um, I will propose each item, and then someone will make a motion, move to discussion after getting a second as to the item. And again, this is a discussion on the adoption of procedural options for weighing evidence. So this was in the meeting materials, right? And so the seven options span from oral testimony, written comments, public comments, um, and other sorry, thank you, telephone calls to the DOJ, task force member input, and reading materials before every meeting. So basically, we have to, as a task force, come together and decide how we want to deal with each of these procedural uh, mechanisms for weighing evidence. 
So let's just start for number one. I'll give a, a quick overview for number one. So number one is about oral testimony. So throughout this process, we will be um, receiving oral testimony. And the state and the California Department of Justice has laid out two options, but we have we can discuss other options. But the California Department of Justice has laid out two options that we can consider in terms of how, as a task force, we want to engage with oral testimony. So for instance, option one is that we incorporate oral testimony into our written report. The second option would be that we post written, a written version of oral testimony on the website. And then again, there, there's an additional option that we can consider today. That could be a combination of both, right? Like, so for instance, I'm just putting this out there. We can, you know, look at what are some, you know, uh, pertinent or relevant or even like striking, moving oral testimony. We could choose to put those in the written, in the written report um, and then put the rest on the website or vice versa. So um, at this time, I will ask for a motion. So is there a motion on the first item? And so that would look like um, as a task force member, you would say, you know, I move that we adopt option one or I move that we adopt option two or I move for another option and then we'll have a discussion. And I'll give you a second to um, kind of digest this in case um, you weren't able to kind of look through the meeting materials in depth and really consider these options before the meeting. So I'll, I'll take a, a pause. Um, but then when we are ready, um, I would ask a member to entertain a motion for number one oral testimony. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm wondering if there could be a, a hybrid. Um, in my experience on, for example, the Blue Ribbon Commission, we did both option one and option two. We included um, all testimony on the commission's website so that people could actually see the PowerPoints uh, or any narrative um, um, reports that were submitted as part of testimony. And then in the, the final report of the commission, uh, we would reference or quote things from the test of oral testimony and also could include in the, and included in the appendix the, the full report or narrative um, from that, that oral testimony. So I'm wondering if there could be an option three that allows for both. Okay, great. Would you like to make a motion on that matter? Then we can have a discussion on it. Okay. Yes, okay. I'd like to make, to make a motion that we consider option three, which is a combination of options one and two we will post oral testimony on the website um, immediately after uh, testimony is given, and we will also incorporate uh, oral testimony into the written report um, as appropriate in terms of whether it's in the full body narrative or it's in the appendix. Is there a second? Second down. You. So it has been moved and seconded to um, implement option three, which is a combination thereof of option one and two, whereby we will post all oral testimony on the website immediately after each public hearing and then incorporate oral testimony as appropriate into the written report um, get, if, it, it, if it's applicable to the larger body narrative. Um, is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing that there is no discussion on this motion, um, are we ready for a vote? 